my parents are psychologists. So I always thought I will never ever study psychology because the only thing we will talk about is like what happens when we do such a thing or how do people react or what's productive or counterproductive. And there I ended up studying psychology in the end. <laughs> Welcome to the Agile Innovation Leaders Podcast. I'm Ola Ojako. On this podcast, I speak with world-class leaders and doers about themselves and a variety of topics spanning agile, lean innovation, business, leadership, and much more with actionable takeaways for you, the listener. Hello, everyone. My guest today is Renata Kramer, an agile coach and trainer with Gladwell Academy. Prior to becoming an Agile coach, she trained and practiced as a psychologist. Amongst her multiple qualifications, she is a certified SBC, that's a Skilled Agile Framework Program Consultant. She's also an Associate Certified Coach with the International Coaching Federation. She is the Chairwoman of the Agile Coach Conference an annual event for coaches and leaders in Agile teams and organizations. I had lots of aha moments recording this episode with Renata. We talked about what the Agile coach does for a team and the wider organizations, some proven effective coaching techniques that have worked for Renata and many other interesting topics. Without further ado, my conversation with Renata. Thank you for listening and watching. Thank you so much, Renata, for making the time for this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ula, for inviting me. Great. My pleasure. Now, could you tell us a bit about how you ended up where you are currently, Renata? Yeah, sure. So I'm currently working as a agile coach and an agile trainer in a um, yeah, more or less consulting firm. So what we do is we um, we uh, broadcast the uh, agile mindset and then see where there might be any opportunities for either individuals or teams or whole organizations to go in a transformation. And in that perspective, I'm coaching teams. So like more operational on a team level and as well thinking on longer term perspective. And then your question was, how did you get there? So this was something that um, wasn't my idea in the beginning. So I was like, when I was a kid, I wouldn't be thinking like, oh, I'm going to be a, a agile coach or like. We didn't even didn't... know what that was. Yeah, exactly. I didn't know what that title was. <laughs> it didn't even exist. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> now agility did. But um, no, I, I'm coming from a, um, um, a family which is really engaged in people and human behavior and uh, how, how we all relate and the, the, the community thinking and building. And both of my parents are psychologists. So I always thought I will never, ever study psychology because the only thing we will talk about is like what happens when we do such a thing or how do people react or what's productive or counterproductive. And there I ended up studying psychology in the end. <laughs> Interesting. And do you have any regrets for going the path, going down that path? Well, the funny thing is, it's interesting that you say this because even as a psychologist and I went for the labor and organization. So it's really more on teams and on work motivation and on uh, the workplace, because obviously our workplace has been changing tremendously in the hmm. last decades. Um, I never thought that I'm like, as a psychologist would end up in like this more organizational structures. Um, but then the path has, yeah, has been shaping just, through coincidences and interested in team dynamics. And now mm. I'm really glad that I'm here. Uh, the funny thing is never anticipated on it happening like this. Yeah. So, so how did that bridge, you know, when you went into the, uh, y- you studied psychology and then you were, um, you, you specialized in, in, in the psychology of organizations, if I may put it that way, how did you now, get end up being an agile coach and trainer 
Well, this basically come, came from one of my friends. So I was at that moment in, an, in a position where I was mentoring or maybe supporting team man- managers. So they were facing some struggles with their team and how could they optimize to high performance? And my friend told me, hey, this is interesting because what you're doing links directly to a lot of the practices we see in, in agility or in Scrum even. Only you, you name it differently. You're talking about personality styles or resistance or conflict behavior. Well, in Scrum, we, we use a structure hmm. and we follow a cadence of the structure in order to resolve all the issues that you're thinking about as well. But we, there's a little bit of a gap. So this, like I thought that in agility, we don't talk about that undercurrent, the hmm. softer side. And in psychology, we don't talk about the frameworks and the structures. So those could be bridged really nicely. Hmm. Interesting. And, and actually, both are complementary because you can't have one without the other. That You need the hard, uh, well, I say data and facts, but you also mm-hmm. need the, you know, the softer side because not everything is encompassed in, in data or framework and you have to yeah. be able to adapt to contexts. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, if it were to be a computer, <laughs> you know, you could put in a program and you get the same thing out consistently. But when it's humans, never, <laughs> you, can, you can never have the same outcome um, for, with two teams, never. And anyway. that makes it fun as well, right? It makes it fun. And yeah, <laughs> and, and that's what, you know, they say variety is the spice of life. So what would you say then? Or who would you say is an agile coach in your definition? Hmm. <laughs> in my definition, <laughs> interesting that you specified like that. <laughs> I would say that what I try to be as an agile coach is the, the go-to person for either any like impediments that members or uh, roles or organizations face and that you're going to think along with the, the person or the team in order to strive for a, a better next step and obviously try to make it small and incremental. Mm. On top of that, because it's, it's not only about receiving questions, but on top of that, I think a very, very crucial role of an agile coach is being the person that's able to zoom out and look into meta perspective, dares to take the time to observe what's going on and dares to reflect on, hey, this is what's happening in out of experiences or, or like knowledge or theories. We know that it can be improved. So let's prompt a new idea and then set a pilot or an experiment. Hmm. Now, that's an interesting concept. And what, something that jumped out to me as you were speaking is that, you know, as an agile coach, you zoom out. So you're looking at the big picture and not just mm-hmm. focusing on what's happening at that time, at point in time. Um, mm-hmm. So would you say that it helps for the agile coach to kind of be a bit removed from, you know, what's happening as a kind of a third party, but still part of the team? I think that's a nice way to phrase it. Indeed, you def- definitely want to build on creating this trust and this is relation- trustworthy relationship with psychological safety. Mm. Um, so, so it is, it is, A connection, but then still indeed on a little bit of on the side because you're not involved in the product or the solution that the team is working on, but on the process. Hmm. So you're attached and not attached. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, that's uh, that's a good thing to have because you you wouldn't be as you'll be a bit Mm. detached from Mm -hmm. from the happenings and might be hopefully a bit more objective about what's happening instead of being too emotionally attached to the outcome of conversations for example yeah Yeah. so apart from because you mentioned you know observing helping the teams to you know look look at their processes and and hopefully you know work towards getting better outcomes um, now, what else, what other roles could an Agile coach play? It's, uh, it's interesting is that it's, it's very diverse in, in the perspective of are you an internal ex- Agile coach or externally? So you can really go from operational to tactical to strategical um, decisions or um, yeah, 
application of what you're doing. Mm. So in the, in the kickstart of, 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 of a new transformation, you would be very operational um, teaching about uh, the agile mindset. So you share the, um, the manifesto and the principles behind it, the values that we know, like respect and transparency and openness yeah. and such, and, and really advocating why this can be relevant. Hmm. Then we can address the phrase of you rather um, be agile than just do agile or, uh, or with Scrum it's the same because otherwise you're just missing your goals of yes. coming to higher performance. Yeah, so that would be like, like very operational, but also on road mapping in, in where do we see an organization like moving towards or hmm. how can we optimize the, the time to market or and new markets to reach for our customers. This could also be uh, in collaboration with an agile coach. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. I mean, so what about, um, you know, the, uh, the framework proposed by Lisa Atkins, which mm -hmm. you, you also taught us during the IC agile coach uh, course, because I was mm -hmm. your student on that course and <laughs> I, I really found it very valuable. So yeah. Lisa, I mean, in, in her framework, she was also suggesting, you've already mentioned the part of a teacher. Yeah. If there's also a facilitator, uh, maybe technical expertise or business uh, um, ex expertise and all that. Yeah. What's your view on, on, on that framework and guidance? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful framework to explore your competences, also your background and, and optimizing your skills. So Lisa Atkins is, talking about on the process side, you want to facilitate the agile process moving further. This would be with like with your detachment we just spoken about before you're really next to the team. And I was like, think you walk the path together and then like the team executes or the organization executes, but you're like facilitating it to be happening. Hmm. And on the same process side, you also meant mentoring. This is where you bring in your experience that you have been gaining with other assignments or maybe at other departments in the organization and you mentioned hey okay uh, this is a question that has been raised like for example um how to move forward with a team that uh, like has some um has, has, has too little time and therefore cannot execute on, on scrum because it will become overhead well and then from your experience you're going to share some ideas that's on the process side and on the other side content wise and this is what we just touched upon with teaching hmm. it's also important to share and advocate the knowledge of uh, of the uh, the agile reasonal and mindset and this on the teaching it would be really transferring knowledge so then you're you're the content owner and you transfer the knowledge um yeah and and on the coaching side you you have the answers yourself of the coach hmm. she has the answers yourself and you're just asking questions to uh, bring that further yeah, so that's the four competences from our framework. Hmm. Thanks for, for going through those, Renata. You know, when, when, when I mention the word coach, most people, you know, tend to, their minds tend to go in, into the sporting context. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. I've had to resort to, you know, explaining my role as an agile coach in that context, because that's something that they can identify with. And I usually would tell them, okay, you know what? The coach might not be the best player at that sport, but because they have that, you know, to use your word, they're able to zoom out and see the big picture. They, you know, they are committed to making the players, you know, to play their best game and to equip them to play mm -hmm. their best game. The same thing with me as an agile coach. I may not know the intricacies of your role as well as you do, and I may, and, and and that's okay. But the key thing is, I'm here to help you to yeah. play your best game and to incrementally get better over time. Now, what's your view on on this perspective? Are there any parallels between you know the role of a, an agile coach and and the coach in the sporting arena? Yeah, yeah, I love love the way how you uh, you explain this just now as well because there there are definitely parallels and as a, a sports coach you you help the team in order to come to that high performing. I love the word high performing because we want to have the same in the workplace. We want optimization of all these individuals that are all totally different that have their own story to tell that communicate that behave in their own way, and how can we 
yeah, be on the site indeed, what you mentioned then, and, and not being like a content owner, but you're more a process owner. So to, to push them forward and to be some sort of like what, what you like to call as well a servant leader. So it's mm-hmm. not about you. It's about the group and it's about the transformation there and the transformation goals they set themselves. So if the parallel works and it's, it's a proper way to explain, then definitely that works because maybe previously we have been thinking about managers in the traditional form, which are maybe more of the experts, which tell you what to do. And we're nowhere like that. We, we, we want to see like, okay, you are, you know, all the, you are the expertise and you have the expertise and you know about all the like relevant information with regards to the solution you're heading towards and a coach is just there to make that more smooth Hmm. Hmm. great response now from your perspective and your experience what are some of the effective coaching techniques that have worked for you yeah yeah, interesting. This is something that a lot of coaches are like exploring. Well, wh- what has impact and how do we move this forward? Because there's so much to do and what will be our first step? So what I love to do just with any new assignment or like team is just first explore the context as it is now. So setting interviews with each and seeing every one of the team and the people surrounding the team or the organization, like, like the most relevant stakeholders. And just assess where we're at, wh- what do we really, really see that is that 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 helps us to move further and what are like uh, blocking issues. And if you assess all these blocking issues, then that's your first step in towards making your roadmap for new interventions. And then very to make it very, very specific. It's about active listening and asking powerful questions like what makes your work valuable for you? What, what, what provides you energy? What's your energy drainer? Like mm-hmm. these sort of questions that sometimes people are not even used to like responding to or getting asked. Mm. So what makes a powerful question powerful? If there's a silence like this, so this, <laughs> this would be a powerful question. <laughs> if it's a question, I would say that um, brings reflection okay. on where are we at now, but what would I actually want? And then the next step would be how to get there. Hmm. Great. So a powerful question makes the, re- and the receiver of the question reflect on where they are now where they want to be moving forward and, and, and also how to get there. Yeah. Um, well, and you need multiple powerful questions in order to address all of these, but <laughs> indeed this is what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Yes. In the coaching process. So mm-hmm. would you say for every coaching session that you do, then do you always like set targets for the conversation in terms of expected outputs and outcomes? Or do you sometimes have, you know, like, will I say like free form conversations, which with no set agenda? Mm. Well, in, in, even if you have an informal conversation, it's very, very helpful to think and think yourself of what do I want to get out of it? What should the other person get out of this, but also just address it. Hmm. So just before this conversation, we had a, a coaching conversation, which was, uh, about an hour or a little less and uh, mm. I would always start with obviously how are you and, and what's going on but w- what would make this conversation impactful for you because our time is spare and in like in informal conversations are important so you do need to like have icebreaks and, and connect to each other but I would always want to know like what's in your mind what do you want to talk about well where are we heading towards yeah so that you are able to evaluate at the end of the conversation you know was it really successful or not this is this is indeed one of the more important things and on top of that also to make sure that that we don't go into assumptions because there's like our our brain is full of filling like continuously filling gaps so we continuously go and jump into 
assumptions and and we 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 anticipate on okay the other person most likely wants to but without checking we never know true and 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 the thing is we we see the world from our world view which is colored by our individual experiences and what we've been taught and for each person even if we're from the same family sometimes mm-hmm. We, we still tend to have like different worldviews because we have our personalities and all that. So I really like the fact that you pointed out, you know, you don't want people to base, uh, to, to kind of impose their assumptions, unstated assumptions, especially in a conversation. Hello again. The annual Agile Coach Conference is coming up in March, 2022. Hosted by Gladwell Academy with a dynamic lineup of speakers. The event theme is Changing Times Require Agile Minds. It promises to be an exciting event for networking, learning, and sharing experiences. For more information and the opportunity to grab an early bird ticket, go to gladwellacademy.com forward slash events and click on the Agile Coach Conference. That's gladwellacademy.com forward slash events. Back to my conversation with Renata. You, you are also hugely into the you know, emotional quotient and, and leadership. Could you tell us about this? Yeah, so uh, th- this actually originated again back to my studies when um, I did some research in conflict resolution and within a manager or a leader in how to deal with relational conflict and task conflict. And this is where like, my interest it's, like, started to happen with regards to, okay, we actually need conflict as well in order to innovate again. So that triggered me a bit. And then what we noticed is that our leaders that had a, a higher like EQ, how you say it, eh? yes, emotional quotient, um, they, it was easier for them to adapt towards going from a like disruptive conflict towards a productive conflict because we need the conflicts, but they need to help us instead of totally block us. Yeah. So it depended on the leader in order to like tilt the conflict into a new way of behavior. Hmm. And I thought that was extremely relevant because we as a society Hmm. focus on EQ, like the intelligence rather than on the emotional quotient. So how come we have such a focus to that intelligence in EQ, but then AQ is not there. So that's, that's fascinating. Hmm. Yeah, I, I agree that, you know, for a long time, the, uh, the focus has been on the IQ, you know, the yeah. intelligence question, mm-hmm. how, mm-hmm. how intelligent someone is and, you know, who's uh, um, admitted to the Mensa. I can't remember what yeah. the name of that society yeah. is, um, but it, life is not just about, you know, one type of intelligence. Can one improves one EQ and then... If so, how can leaders identify where they are and what yeah. to do to improve this? Well, if you find me the answer to the first question, then I, we're going to start our <laughs> own organization together. <laughs> because this is a few, I think two years ago, I, with one of the, one of uh, like a PO in the training, we were talking about this and we, we, we made a little workshop about uh, emotional intelligence. And then we went into some research and then it stated that you like very black and white that I'm going to frame to now, but on this side of the spectrum, you have people that are totally experts. They know every single detail about one element of whatever technical expertise they're in. Then on this side of the spectrum, you have people that are more generalists and yeah. they, they, they are very, they this meta viewing or they love it. And they are about narratives and storytelling. Well, if on this side, then with would be experts, you go for storytelling and they, no, they provide you facts. And we, we tried to link this yeah, because in the brain, you see that it's about bridging from uh, this 
uh, side of the brain towards the other side and, and the neurons would yes. fire all over the place. So it's just a different brain structure, which fascinated me. And there we kind of, it blocked because if it's a structure in your brain and it's how, how all our, the connections with the neurons are made, then is it trainable? I definitely think it's to train in a certain extent, but I don't have the answer to what extent because mm. maybe obviously the, what you mentioned as well, it's sports. Maybe you're a, a perfect, uh, you like running and then you have, you have an athlete body for running. Mm -hmm. I don't. And that's in our, like uh, how we are like the build, the structure of our body and we can train it obviously, but I will never be as good as r in running as you are. Sure. And I think this is what we try to, what we want to explore with regards to this whole leadership topic. Hmm. Everybody can set the fundament and that I'm hundred percent sure of. And that's just a matter of being aware of hmm. the whole impact of uh, emotional intelligence and intelligence and training yourself in asking the right questions or stopping and doing in the meta viewing and going into system thinking and, and like, etc. But I the answer to how to assess where you're at. Hmm. Not sure. Well, I think it's a, it's a homework for myself. Um, maybe <laughs> you can feel free to join me <laughs> if you want yeah. to, to look at that. Okay. Well, so what, what, what <laughs> books would you, would you recommend for someone who wants to learn more about these topics? <laughs> All right. Great, great. Yeah. So um, there's definitely Daniel Coleman, which yes. is for in, in emotional intelligence. He is, he's really um, known. So these books I'm really fascinated about. And another one would be the book M Empathy, yeah. uh, which is obviously there on the shelf, but just forgot the author right now. And then okay. on top of that, with the, with regards to this, um, the brain structure and 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 how to go around like this flexibility in in in, in moving for motivation styles behavior, I like switch a lot. So it's mm. very interesting on like how does our rational and our cognitive uh, relate to each other, and how can we even used to to go towards a transformational mm. journey yeah i think switch is writ was written by um the brothers cheap and dan heath mm -hmm. i believe Correct. yes yeah yeah, yeah. i i in, i've listened to a couple of their books and yeah i have enjoyed their writing style yeah uh, sorry to have interrupted was there any more books you had in mind to share yeah the last one i keep on referring every single time is the power of habit mm. And why, because the principle of the power of the habit is, is, is so simple. It's, we are all known to go into these habits and it connects also to assumptions and to jumping into conclusions. That's habits because we need that in order to make sure that we are not getting overwhelmed or that they're like, we can handle everything that happens during the day. Knowing at the workplace what our habits are and how to move from the one trigger to a to a um uh, a reaction word? yeah no not a reaction but a, a reward from a trigger to a reward is oh, right. we can we can build ourselves new routines and i think that was really fascinating because as a leader but also as a coach or also as an individual think about triggers rewards and then building new routines in order to go into change behavior hmm. Hmm. It's almost like um, the book. It reminds me of the book Atomic Habits by um, I can't. Is it James? I can't remember the author, but you know, it, there was also something about when you want to create positive habits, also mm -hmm. kind of associate with it, you know, some sort of reward. It's almost like the Pavlovian response, where mm -hmm. you know, um, Pav, you know, the, the um, mm -hmm. experimenter was it would ring a bell and feed the dogs, and then at yep. a point in time when he rang the bell, the dogs were salivating. In the same way, for example, if I want to get into a more um, you know, healthy routine, exercising regularly. I could put my, you know, place my my um, exercise gear um, mm -hmm. um, in place, and then maybe reward myself with an episode of my favorite uh, series. You know, yeah. for that day. So I'm associating it with at the end of this exercise, I'll get to watch 30 minutes of my favorite series, and and at a mm -hmm. point in time, there'll be a positive connection between yeah. this beneficial habit 
and yeah. something um, that I'm going to get from it as well. Yeah, it, it looks so similar. And, and uh, just if we um, bridge that towards our workplace, a culture of an organization has exactly the same patterns, right? Mm. So how can we use any relevant triggers in order to uh, bring ourselves toward that transformational behavior? Because that's what we want to do. Mm-hmm. But but it, it would, I mean, this is something I, I could talk about for ages and ages, but we don't have the time now. But I'll, I'll ask you this one last question. Now, whilst there are meant to be like positive associations, or we should create that those connections between, you know, the change or the actions we need to make towards a change and positive um, rewards that would be associated with them. Is it possible that at some point in time, you know, these could be turned into weapons, you know, like a carrot and a stick? Mm-hmm. And if it's possible, how can we strike the balance so that, you know, we don't go too much into okay, saying, okay, we're getting people to conform or they, they would just temporarily mm-hmm. adapt how they are behaving just mm-hmm. because of the reward and they're not doing it, you know, it doesn't get to be a culture or a norm, but it's more like, okay, this is a behavior, yeah. I think leadership would reward and I'll do it as long as it pays Mm. would you say that you like the context of reward in this extent how Mm. do you do you see that as a like like a salary or a bonus or would we refer reward reward as more than just this it could be anything I mean because for different people that very I mean and research has proven that Mm -hmm. there is an extent to which you improve someone's salary, then it stops being a, of any consequence right. at all. So it now goes into, you know, back to Simon Sinek's, uh, no, who yeah. was it that wrote? The, yeah, but yeah, so there is a limit to what, you know, a bonus or salary could do. It does to an extent improve people's uh, performance, but at a point in time, it stops the matter. So reward could be anything. Right. And, yeah, so I agree with you there. Like, there's be, like the intrinsic or extrinsic kind of reward, right? And if we can find a way to connect to everybody's intrinsic rewards, then I think it's really about something doing for yourself rather than because leadership wants to. Mm-hmm. No, that's a, a great answer. So, thanks for sharing, you know, some book recommendations with us. These will be in the show notes. Now, would there be anything else you'd like the audience to know about? Right. Yeah. So what's interesting, what we see happening in, in like the, the function of being an agile coach is that we, we really see a need for communities and people are trying to find each other talking about what we have been talking about today as well. What are techniques, but also what is our perspective? Which way are we heading as like a community of coaching and an ambassador of the agile movement and therefore um, at Gladwell Academy where I'm working we introduced a conference which is the Agile Coaching Conference and we're heading uh, towards uh, the new edition so the second edition it would be really great uh, just to spread the word because we're going to have um, like lovely speakers like yourself as well uh, so glad that you can join us My pleasure. and yeah and, and and I think it's a great start to uh, sharing all our knowledge and all our ideas because this is something we can never do alone and and we need each other definitely and it is an exciting it promises to be an exciting uh, event so Mm. could you clarify is it going to be in person or a virtual event right yeah so Obviously, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but at this moment, we anticipate on an event in Amsterdam, uh, obviously with speakers locally, but also um, uh, virtually connecting to us with breakouts so that we go into small workshops with keynotes, etc. If things might change, then obviously we go 100% remote, which we did in the the previous year as well. Okay. And where can the audience find out more about the Agile Coaching Conference as Mm. well as how can they reach you? 
Right. Yeah. So if there's uh, any interest into the gladwellacademy.com website, this is where we uh, indeed find both our um, yeah, vision on transformation, the coaching and the training itself, and also a direct link to events. And then it says the Agile Coach Conference. Okay. So this is the best way to reach out. Okay. And what about you personally? Are you on social media? Do you welcome people getting in touch with you? Yeah, definitely on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's an open account. So uh, Renata Kramer, and then you find me for Gladwell. Uh, always very happy to connect and also to share some ideas via the messages. Okay. Thank you so much, Renata, for sharing um, these details. We will put them in the show notes for the mm-hmm. audience to access. Now, before we round up, do you have any final words for the audience to close us yeah. out? Definitely, definitely. I, I, I'm, I'm so glad that these sort of conversations are happening because this is the only way to start talking about like what are we trying to make happen? How, how do we support each other as, as Agile ambassadors? And, and just learning from each other is as in the Agile mindset. So keep on connecting all the dots and trying to find how can we best work together. Great words of wisdom, Renata. Thank you so much for sharing your vast knowledge and experience with us today. Thank you, Ella. Thank My you so pleasure. much for being here. Great. That's all we have for now. Thanks for listening. If you like this show, do subscribe at www.agileinnovationleaders.com. That's agileinnovationleaders.com or your favorite podcast provider. Also share with friends and do leave a review on iTunes. This would help others find this show. I'd also love to hear from you. So please drop me an email at ola at agileinnovationleaders.com. Take care and God bless.